Well, we're going to go ahead and start with the very top of the conference with UAB. Their win total set at eight and a half. They are plus 185 to win Conference USA in terms of their S&P plus projection offensively and defensively, 63rd on the offensive side of the ball, 44th defensively. And this has been a Bill Clark, you know, rebuild. Unfortunately, Bill Clark won't be able to see it all the way through. He steps away from the program. Bryant Vincent is now the new head coach replacing Clark. He was the former OC and quarterback coach. And when you look at this team, they're still very similar to the previous, you know, um, previous teams that we've seen on the field in terms of they have a great running game. Dwayne McBride is a bell cow. He's back seven starters on defense. And honestly, if there was ever a time with a transition going on for a cushy non-conference schedule, this is it. They get Alabama A&M at Liberty, Georgia Southern, and they spread out that one challenging punching up moment against LSU late in November. So they can get plenty of positive momentum right out of the gate. I'm going to go to you, Ionello. What are your thoughts on UAB being the you know odds on favor, quote unquote, here in Conference USA and their win total set at eight and a half? Yeah, I agree with it. You know, I, I definitely going through these think they stood out as probably the best team in the conference. Um, I actually do like this over. Um, as you mentioned, their non-con is very easy. Um, they get UTSA at home late in the year, which is going to be big for them getting that game at home. And, and you mentioned they bring back their starting quarterback, their starting running back, their best receiver. They bring back four offensive linemen. Their secondary is nasty and brings back everyone. They have, you know, their safeties are great. Their corners are great. They were 16th in total defense last year. Um, Dylan Hopkins, I thought, did really well down the stretch. He didn't really take over until like week four, I think was his first start. You know, 18 touchdowns, just seven picks. He's got an absolute cannon. So I'm, I'm bullish on UAB this year. Obviously, the one, you know, pause is is bill clark retiring but you know they just they just elevated the oc so you you would assume that they can keep it going um i probably won't bet them to win the conference just because i don't think there's much value in that number but given how easy their non-con is i mean you, you mentioned the alabama a&m at liberty who takes a step back i assume georgia southern at rice middle tennessee you know they probably start five and oh but then they go, you know, Charlotte, Western Kentucky. So like they could really realistically have this number pretty much up before the LSU game anyway. So I do like UAB and I do like that over eight and a half. And just quickly, you mentioned having their best wide receiver back, Trey Shropshire. It was a great win. And I love it when the small schools can actually retain their guys. I think he like dipped a toe in the transfer portal and was like, no, I'm going to come back. That's a huge win for them. He's somebody that is pretty much irreplaceable, you know, year over year. They're not going to be able to plug and play. So to have him back in the fold, I think it is a huge get. I think these numbers, at least the win total is properly priced. So it's a pass for me. And then I agree, plus 185. Why am I going to tie up my money for five months when I can probably just, you know, wait and play them down the stretch? There's lots of different ways that you can extract more or less the same value with a different time horizon. All right, now turning our attention to a podcast favorite, the University of Texas at San Antonio. Go Roadrunners, meet Meep. I'm excited about this team. And, and honestly, even though this is a group of five podcasts, I'm not a believer in that, hey, you run the table. Why aren't you in the college football playoff conversation? That just should never be the case. It's, it's got to be based on who you beat, where you play them. And in a lot of cases, you can take, you know, there's 60 plus teams in the G5 level. Um, you can probably take half of them right away and say, even if you were to run the table, you're not making the playoff. So like you guys are, are shoved to the side immediately. It really comes down to scheduling. It's one of my beliefs. I, I, I can't help myself on Twitter. I get in arguments about this all the time. College football has a scheduling problem. In some cases, it's self-inflicted. In other cases, you know, you get a little bit too big for your britches and you don't want to play, you know, two games on the, on the road in a three game series, something like that. There's lots of different reasons why these games don't get scheduled, but UTSA, when you look at the beginning of their season, kind of tailor made for national attention, they get Houston at home. How big is that? That's like, that's like a G five kickoff classic right away. I think it should have tons of attention, even though it's in week one up against some of the other major games, two really quality teams that won a ton of games last year, both over 10 wins. Then they're at army and then at Texas, which I believe is right after they play Alabama. So talk about a letdown spot one way or the other, Texas wins that game. They can't be focused on UTSA. If they get their doors blown off, then they got to deal with all of the Texas's back jokes for an entire week. I think this sets up when you look at what the Roadrunners bring back for potentially a hot start and to get themselves firmly implanted into the, the new year's six automatic birth conversation. Frank Harris is back. 
talk about a guy who went from being a potential liability to an asset in one year. I mean, he was just so good last year. His three lead wide receivers are back headlined by Zachary Franklin. They bring in a Juco All-American and Ty Edwards to try to replace Sincere McCormick. They're beat up in the spring, so there weren't a lot of backs getting touches, but they're going to have a pretty deep running back room. They also have four returning starters on the O-line. And their defense, even though they have some new pieces to work in, they have experience returning on all three levels. So I'm very excited about this team. Their win total set at eight. They're two to one to win Conference USA. SP Plus has them 37th on offense, 91st on defense. I think the offense, to be honest, I think th this is a little bit overinflated about just how good Sincere McCormick was. And he was great. But I do think that Ty Edwards has a chance to replace 90% of his production. And if he does that and the, the quarterback play from Harris remains at this level, I think they are my pick, at least to win Conference USA. And I think they're going to split the, the Houston and Texas games the against Burnt Orange. How many Roadrunner fans do you think are going to show up in Austin? I think that's a, a really fun opportunity for them. I think they're going to play up in that game. So I'm going to see them going two and one out of the gate. What are your thoughts on them, Ionella? Yeah, you know, I'm high on them as well. I think, you know, obviously we loved them last year. Meet Meep all day. Um, I agree. I think they're in the in the conference title game again against UAB. Um, I would probably pick them in that game, to be honest with you. Um, I'm a little more worried about the non-con as you. Um, you mentioned the win total around eight, eight and a half, depending on the book. Um, I'm more on UABs than I am UTSAs, just given the, the difference in the non-con, because I wouldn't be shocked if UTSA starts one and two. Um, and I mentioned UAB gets the game at home, but UTSA does uh, get a bye the week before. So that that two weeks, you know, probably negates the home field advantage there. So I think that's going to be a good game. Um, like you mentioned it, you know, Frank Harris went from, uh, okay, just give the ball to McCormick and get out of the way to now. I mean, he's probably the best quarterback in this conference. Gets all the weapons back. Rashad Wisdom is probably the best defender in this conference. He's He's back again. He's one of those you know, do it all center fielder safeties that flies around, makes tackles, gets involved in the passing game. Um, so I am, I'm bullish on UTSA again. They're another team that I will be rooting for and probably betting on week to week. Um, but I don't have anything in them as far as preseason goes. Their, their non-con just scares me enough to, to stay away the win total. For our next team, a pod favorite again, Western Kentucky sitting at eight and a half on their win total, minus 130 to the under, five to one to win Conference USA. 30th and SP plus on offense, 96 on defense. For me, I'm just going to get this out of the way immediately. This is a Shawn Michaels, Ric Flair moment where I'm about to say, I'm sorry before we're killing these guys, but I loved you. Zach Kitley's gone. Bailey Zappi's gone. Jarrett Dagey is no Bailey Zappi. I know that they have some interesting pieces at wide receiver, but this defense was really bad last year. And I would be shocked if they cracked the top 100 defensively. Now, it's going to be masked early on by the fact that week zero, they play Austin P at Hawaii, at Indiana, Auburn late in the season. So they're not going to get exposed by an SEC team, lose by 40 early. I actually think what's going to happen in this case, though, is that it's going to be a team that potentially could be treading water through September. And then I want to hammer them when they get to Conference USA, because I just do not think that they have the offense to keep up. I understand that they have continuity at the very top, you know, with their head coach, but Kitley, it was magic. And now he's in Lubbock. He's in Texas tech. Bailey's gone. This is it. I mean, th there's no real pillars of last year's aerial attack that made them so special and so fun to root for. Is this a team you're going to stay away from for sentimental reasons? Or are you going to join me in fading the Hilltoppers? I I hate it. I love this under. I, I absolutely love this under. I hate to do it. I'm wearing my zappy shirt. But you said it. This under is out of respect for Bailey Zappi because he's gone. Kaylee's gone. Their top two running backs are gone. Their top two receivers are gone. You know, Stearns is in the NFL. Mitchell Tinsley translated to Penn State. Jared Daigie's, this is what, like his seventh year playing college football. He's thrown for 10,000 yards, but he still threw, he threw 12 picks last year at West Virginia. And the idea of having an offense that is predicated on Jarrett Daigie throwing the ball 50 times a game is terrifying. And at the end of the day, as much as, you know, no one loved Western Kentucky more than you and me, their win total is at eight and a half. They only won eight regular season games last year. You're telling me this team is going to win more games than last year's team. They're on their third straight season with a new defensive coordinator. Their defense, you mentioned it wasn't good last year. Yeah. You know, they start with Austin P at Hawaii, but then they go to at Indiana who beat them last year. We, we don't know what Indiana's going to be. Late in the season, they play at Auburn, 
at FAU, at UTSA, at Charlotte. So there's no way I think this team wins more games than last year's team did. So if you're going to give me eight and a half, I have to take the under. I, I love last year. We'll always have last year, guys. But I'm going under. All right, we're going to jump quickly to – there's a bunch of middling teams here. We'll see if we can pull out one that maybe we like as a dark horse. FAU set at 6.5 for their win total. Over is uh, minus 120 on the juice. 10-1 to 1 to win Conference USA. Pretty bad on both sides of the ball, at least by S&P plus projections. 91st on offense, 98th on defense. I still think they could be decent. You know, Nikosi Perry has been there in the, at least the college football ranks forever. He brings back his number one offensive weapon, LaJonte Wester, and a promising offensive line. The schedule's not doing them any favors, to be honest, though. You know, they start with Charlotte. They're at Ohio. They get UCF to, on the 17th, and then they're at Purdue in the non-conference. I think they could get beat up. And this was a team that it was the opposite last year. They got off to a hot start, but they lost their last four when they were right on the precipice of bowl eligibility. So maybe we see, you know, a role reversal here. People selling quickly on the owls under Willie Taggart. I, they're at least a stay away from me in the month of September, just because I think they have experience, but there's a lot of new offensive line pieces, even though they have some experience there. They got to be really good in that element of the game in the trenches, because if they're not, Nikosi Perry is not a guy who's going to make the big plays under pressure constantly. So uh, it's it's fair to say this is a wait and see situation, but do you have any hot takes on the Owls right out of the gate, Ionella? No, they're a stay away from me too. You mentioned it. Nikosi Perry is one of those guys where like every now and again, he'll make a play that you're like, oh, that's why he was at Miami. And then the next quarter, he'll make a play that you're like, how the hell is this guy even playing football? Um, he's very wildly inconsistent. Um, the defense should be solid again. Their front seven should, should still be pretty good, but they do have some holes on defense to fill. Um, like you mentioned that them, them kind of falling off last year at the end is always a concern. You know, we, we tend to, I like to back teams that ended the year strong versus just, you know, losing four straight games, two of which were to, you know, like they lost to middle Tennessee at the end of the year. Like that, that, that shouldn't be happening to FAU. So we're going to switch it up a little bit here. As I mentioned, there's a bunch of teams in the middle that potentially, you know, could pop. But what I'd like to do is offer three teams. You tell me which one you like the best. We'll run through La Tech, North Texas, UTEP, all in that 12 to 15 to 1 range to win the conference. La Tech has 14 returning starters. The, the tidbit that I'll throw in here, I love when there's a rising coordinator that comes up from the FCS level. Scott Power was an amazing defensive coordinator at Stephen F. Austin, always top 20 units. So I anticipate you know, them potentially improving by leaps and bounds on that side of the ball. North Texas, their win total at six, as I mentioned, 15 to one to win Conference USA. Seth Luttrell has been around for a long time. I mean, he broke through that trick play against Arkansas and their upset win on the punt return. It looked like he was going to be one of those guys to take a stepping stone job from North Texas up to the power five level. It didn't materialize for him, but this team can really run the ball. They returned four or five starters on the offensive line and they won five straight to end the regular season in 2021. Uh, also in terms of a, a potential breakout candidate, Tom Treeb, Juco all American 25 tackles for loss last year. So even though they're 88th in projected defensive efficiency, I could see them being a little bit better on that side of the ball. And then finally, a team that's been close to our heart, UTEP Miners. A lot of familiar faces back. We've got Hardison. we got Awat in the backfield, veteran line. Entire front seven back for Bradley Dale Pavito defense. They finished 35th in total defense last year. And what I love as a gambler, they did exactly what they were supposed to. They beat the teams they were supposed to beat, and they were competitive and lost to the teams that they weren't supposed to beat. So very reliable, not a high-variance team. They do lose Jacob Cowing to Arizona, which hurts because he was their only big play guy, but they do get both New Mexico schools in the non-conference. So that's the Lobos and the Aggies of this three pack INLO and feel free to answer multiple if you feel strongly, but La Tech, North Texas and UTEP, who do you like there? Uh, so I have no, no real feel on La Tech. They're a pass for me. Um, I'll, I'll touch on two. I do like, I do like UTEP. I do like their over. Um, obviously, they lose Jacob Cowing to Arizona is a big loss, but they bring in, you know, uh, I don't even know how to say his name, uh, Juco transfer, Kelly Ak Akari something. Um, good enough. Uh, but like you said, Gavin Hardison's back. He's in their third year. He's gotten better each year. So their defense should be really good again. Um, they return their entire front six. Uh, they need to replace wide receivers and cornerbacks. But other than that, you know, I, I do think the schedule is pretty manageable. Um, 
So I do like the UTEP over. But like you said, this is a fun, I feel like this is going to be a fun conference because obviously UAB and UTSA, I feel like are, are pretty much in a tier of their own. You can make a case that there's seven teams that could finish anywhere from like five to seven wins. So I think there's going to be a lot of toss up games, which allows me to kind of take more dart throws on conference futures because if one of those two big dogs slips up, you know, if Frank Harris gets hurt, if, if Bill Clark leaving really up, you know, upends UAB, any of these teams could be positioned to play in that conference championship game now with, with no divisions. So I'm going to throw a dart here and I'm going to throw a dart with the mean green of North Texas. You mentioned it. They, they've been really, really solid under Seth Luttrell. They've uh, made a bowl in, I believe, what, like five of his six years. Um, and their team, you know, we talked about uh, FAU. They won five straight games to end the year after really switching. You know, they've always been kind of a throw it around team. And they really switched to a run first approach towards the end of the year with DeAndre Torrey. Obviously, he leaves, but they still return three freshman running backs who all had six touchdowns last, at least five touchdowns last year. Ragsdale, Adai, and Isaiah Johnson. On top of that, they bring back Oscar Attaway, who was their leading rusher in 2020, I believe. And then he tore his ACL in spring camp last year. So they are super depth at running back. They bring back their leading receiver from last year, Roderick Burns. They bring back Jire Shorter, who is another you know, highly touted wide receiver who got a season and injury week three. Um, you mentioned the defense bringing in some depth. Katie Davis led the whole conference in tackles last year. He's nasty at linebacker. So for me, with, with North Texas, it really comes down to Austin Onni, their quarterback, who he, he's, he's the Brandon Whedon where he turns 29 in September. He spent six years as a Yankees minor league prospect. He was an outfielder in the Yankees system. Good arm. Um, and, he, you know, he, he definitely struggles with turnovers, but he shows the talent, the arm talent. He has a cannon. And you'd hope a 29-year-old <laughs> can, you know, mature and, and be a team leader and, and cut down on some of those turnovers. Um, I believe it was draft Fandle maybe had a uh, plus 2000 to win the conference. So in, in a conference that we mentioned is so wide open, I'll take a dart though on, on this team that just, they know how to run the ball. They return four offensive line stars. So I think they have so many good pieces in part. If their quarterback can just cut down on the turnovers and one of the top two falls, I think the mean green are in a good position to kind of take a step forward. All right. Going from some teams that depending on how you view it, you could view it optimistically to two teams that I think potentially are headed in the wrong direction. Rick Stock still enters his 17th year in Murfreesboro leading the blue Raiders of middle Tennessee. They only have eight returning starters and they got some problems with the schedule at James Madison, James Madison's very first game at the FBS level, a proud dominant FCS school. You know, that's going to be a wild sellout. Then they go to Colorado state, which we alluded to in the previous Mountain West podcast as a team that could be very dangerous offensively. They're at Miami, Florida as well, all in the month of September. When you look at their win total at five, they're 15 to one to win conference USA. I'm going under. I'm totally passing on them as a quote unquote long shot. 102nd in projected offensive efficiency, 99th in defense. I'm very, very low on the Blue Raiders here. Is there anything I'm missing in terms of, you know, having optimism for a team that, yes, went to the Bahamas Bowl, beat a good Toledo team, but not many of those players are back? What are your thoughts, Ionello? Yeah, I'm with you there. I'm not going to bet the under probably, but they're definitely a stay away from me. They're another one of those teams that's like, they played four different quarterbacks last year, large, you know, some due to injury, large, some due to just, they all weren't very good. You know, Bailey Hockman had a lot of, you know, promise coming in from North Carolina or NC state, uh, just left the program after week three. I, I, you know, we don't even know why that happened. Uh, Chase Cunningham appears like he'll be the starter, I would assume, uh, but he got hurt. We, he tore his ACL week nine last year. Reports out of campus, he's expected to be ready for the start of the season. But again, you know, tearing your ACL in, in November, it, who knows what he'll be, especially early on in the year. They only returned one offensive line starter. The defense was not, you know, completely anemic last year, but a lot of that was they led the country in turnovers. Um, so how much of that can you attribute to turnover luck or how much of it was just, you know, yeah, they, they definitely play that aggressive style, but 
you can't bank on your team leading the country in defensive touchdowns again. So I definitely agree with you that they're, they're a stay away from me. And, and if not, you know, you, you lean to them for them to take a step back. I can't see this team bowling again. Before getting to the absolute dregs of Conference USA, I'm going to change the tenor a bit and bring up one of your favorite teams to discuss, INLO, and that's Charlotte, Club Lit, four and a half for their win total here, 30 to one to win Conference USA, 56th on offense, respectable in SP plus projections, 120th, or excuse me, 130th on defense. So Chris Reynolds, now a six year senior, playing forever. You know what you're going to get with him. His three top pass catchers are back four offensive linemen the defense that was already really bad is breaking in six new starters um not a team that i'm gonna really mess with all season i don't think just because their defense potentially could give up 50 plus points any game that they you know roll the footballs out so i don't know what are your thoughts on the 49ers is it a team that is just uh, a sentimental favorite for you one of your better upset calls in the beginning of the podcast last year where are you on charlotte yeah like you mentioned i had i had them beaten duke last year on the money line that obviously worked Matt Mitchell, play the music, club lit. We're firing it back up over four and a half. Give it to me. You mentioned it. Chris Reynolds is back at the helm. He's another one that's been in college football for 10 years. Um, it's his fifth year. He's already the school's all-time passing leader. He, I love him. He's this short, little, stocky quarterback, but he is a gamer. They bring back their top running backs, all three of their top running backs. They bring back their top three receivers. You know, Victor Tucker, Tucker's been a guy we've loved. We saw Grant Dubois really uh, – he kind of had that big breakout game against Duke. Um, Elijah Spencer was the conference USA freshman of the year. He's back at receiver. They have a solid tight end. Sure. Does the defense concern me a little bit maybe, but they had co-defensive coordinators last year. Did not work. Got rid of them both. Greg Brown, they bring in, he's a veteran. He's been coaching football since 1981. He spent 12 years in the NFL as a DB coach. He's DB coach for Purdue the last two years. And they're really just overhauling this defense, completely overhauling their coverage schemes. So I think the defense does improve a little bit. And I mentioned it, them bringing back everybody on offense. I absolutely love, and there's, like I said, their win total is four and a half. And if you look at this schedule, all right, so they start with the floor at Florida Atlantic, probably a loss. William and Mary at home. Then they go to Maryland, bet that over. I don't care what it is, over 89 and a half. Give me that over. But they get, you know, FIU, which should be a win. They go at Rice, which should be a win. And then they finished the year with the Western Kentucky, Middle Tennessee, La Tech, all those kind of middle teams. We talked about all the toss-up games in here. So if I can sit there and circle three, you know, pretty confident wins between UTEP, Western Kentucky, Middle Tennessee, La Tech, they got to win two of those to hit this win total over. So I love Will Healy. I love what he's done. I love how much the offense brings back. I'm going with the 49ers. Club Lit is going to be bouncing at least five times this year. We can discuss Rice and FIU if we have to hold our nose. I can deal with it. Rice, the Owls, two and a half for their win total, minus 140 to the over, 100 to one to win Conference USA, uh, 127th on offense, 120th in SP plus defensive projections. Mike Bloomgren, you know, you shouldn't be buying any green bananas here. You got to win at least, I'll say, four this season to, you know, have your services retained year over year. Here's a fun fact about his program. He started 14 quarterbacks in the last four years. Not a recipe for his success. They could be okay offensively this year. They do return four on the offensive line. Dean Connors comes in from the, the junior college ranks to help what's actually a pretty decent running back room. But the non-con is brutal at USC, home against Louisiana, at Houston. It's really not going to help them build any momentum in the month of September. But overall, I think this number is a little bit low. I think you can, you can see that by the minus 140 juice on the over. Um, and then we'll just hop to FIU and you can give me your thoughts on, on these two dregs of Conference USA. You know, FIU brings in Mike McIntyre, and it's pretty rare to see a former national coach of the year in Conference USA. He's done a great job in previous stops. He won that, you know, the Bobby Dodd and Eddie Robinson Awards at Colorado. But he's back now. He doesn't have much to work with, only five returning starters. So total rebuild, 113th on the offensive side of the ball for the projections, 131st on defense. It's an FIU team that is just really, really bad. Now, the thing about it, though, is early on, they get Bryant at home, you know, not to not to be messed around with those NEC conference teams at Texas State, at Texas State, and then October 1st at New Mexico State. And then they even get UConn on October 8th. So I understand the three and a half, one game better than Rice, even though in terms of all the projections, both sides of the ball are going to be worse. 
another team where I'm, I'm pulling for them to get those wins so that when they slide into that game in mid-October against UTSA as probably we'll call it a three touchdown underdog, I'm going to slam the Roadrunners in that spot. I want a hot start for the Golden Panthers, and then I just want to fade them. What are your thoughts on race and FIU? Uh, well, first, I just want to say, uh, yeah, Brett M. Murphy just texted me. He actually ran off to go bet Charlotte's win total over. I, I was so convincing. So that's why he had the jet so quick. Um, yeah, these two teams are both bad. What did you say the number was on Rice? Rice is two and a half for their win total, and it's juice minus 140 to the over. So FanDuel and DraftKings actually have it at three and a half juice to the under. Uh, DraftKings is minus 130 under FanDuel is like a ridiculous – Fandle has three and a half minus 180 to the under. Why even hang that number? Who's who's playing that? Um, but DraftKings is minus 130 to the under, three and a half for Rice. That is a little tempting because I don't know how that team gets to four wins because they're bad. They're going to be bad again. You mentioned it. They've played 700 different quarterbacks, one of whom is now their starting wide receiver. So, you know, we'll see how that's when – when the reports of camp are like, oh, Luke McCaffrey is going to take – take this conference by storm it's like well he's been a quarterback for the last like four years and there's a reason that he didn't work there and no one wanted to move to wide receiver um wiley green you know projected starter but he started last year and then lost his job he's battling with tj mcmahon who played well in the last game of the year last year but again it's like why didn't he play the rest of the season um i think rice is gonna be pretty bad um their defense was bad so I, i'm probably if i can get that three and a half I may think about that under Florida international, you know, two and a half, three flat, depending on where you look. They're another one where I really don't have any interest in playing whatsoever. Aren't they the team that didn't, didn't when Butch don't Butch Davis got fired last year. Didn't he like go scorched earth on the way out and be like, they don't give a shit about football or winning at all. And like basically just eviscerated the entire staff. Now they bring in Memphis's defensive coordinator. Pretty sure Memphis's defense was pretty bad last year. So I don't know that that's exactly expiring conference. Gunnar Holmberg, another Duke, you know, maybe you get the, the Duke transfer that throws a million interceptions and drops down to the G5 and, and all of a sudden is not a turnover machine. Um, you know, we saw it work at App State, so maybe that, that helps. But both these teams are really bad. So I would definitely, I would lean under on the Rice three and a half. Um, FIU is probably more a stay away from me. I think the number is just too low. Um, to want to really sweat it, um, but they're both going to be bad. And they're, they're, they're what gives me hope for the Charlotte overs because Charlotte plays them both. Just a little fun fact for any fans who are like, you know what, Ionello, you're making a lot of good points on Rice, three and a half, I want to go under, but minus 180. Well, just go ahead and use a free multiplier. Just parlay it with Arkansas State under five because there's no chance Arkansas State is winning more than five games this year. So that's the free one I'm tagging on to all of my preseason bets just to, you know, flip the number around in my favor. Um, I, I think you did a great job summing it up. These teams don't have a lot of promise right now. And there's plenty of teams in the middle of Conference USA. But if things go right, they're winning seven or eight games, which means somebody's got to do the Lord's work and just rack up those Conference USA conference losses so that all, all the math works out. Somebody's got to lose these games. I think we're staring dead at them here because offensively, both of them are going to be really challenged to move the football and score and be explosive and all. It doesn't even matter the metrics you're looking at. Like the eyeball tests, they're going to be bad on offense. For Mike Ionello, I'm Mike Calabrese. This has been the Big Bets on Campus podcast, our group of five deep dive. We are three-fifths of the way through our G5 preview, which means that we are going to welcome Stucky into the fold, and he's going to help us with the AAC and the MAC, the beloved MAC, before we're all done. So that's going to come in the, the coming week. We'll be done all of our G5 previews by August 8th. So be sure to check your feeds, subscribe, like, share with a friend, share with an enemy. You know what to do. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to the program.